let's get this show on the road. Man, 2079. We're playing in 2021. Okay, let's do a... Let's do a Nimzo slash Queen's Indian. I, that's not something that we have played often, but it is my second opening after the King's Indian. Okay, Bishop D2. So Bishop D2... Okay, Bishop D2 is a move. It's not considered theoretically topical. It's quite passive. But it's been gaining some popularity, actually, recently. So the Nimzo Indian is a very easy opening to pick up. You basically just develop your pieces. And then there are a couple of specific setups that you should know. Okay, so A3, we take on C3. That's kind of the point of the Nimzo Indian. It, it, we're making it harder for white to occupy the center with E2, E4 by weakening white's control over the e4 square. And we do that by taking the knight on c3 off the board. So one of the, the most typical Nimzo Indian setups involves positioning your pieces as follows. You play b6, bishop, b7, and then d6, knight, bd7. So you create these little holes for your pieces. And that is considered one of the most solid setups available in the Nimzo Indian. So the move d5 here would be fine but not very not really in the spirit of the nimzo indian so we are going to play this in the spirit of the nimzo indian we're going to play d6 and knight bd7 and this is a very very common and very solid setup because there are no weaknesses you know now we have to continue improving our position we positioned our pieces on the squares we were supposed to position them and now there are a couple of subsequent follow-up plans so one of them is to play something like queen to e7 and then push e6, e5. But a more aggressive idea that I really like involves playing the move knight to e4, which is a pretty natural move, and then following up with f5. I mean, this is an idea that you should be very familiar with if you're, you know, over 1500, for example. Knight e4 and f5, this is a, a ubiquitous idea across many different openings. Rook a to d1. Now, of course, we have the option of eliminating, of subtracting white's bishop from the board. One way, we, one way we could play this is to take the bishop and then actually get the other knight around to e4. Another pretty classic uh, cl classic concept. I don't feel strongly about that one way or the other. The bishop on c3 does have a pretty bright future, especially if white pushes d5 at some point. So it, it might be worth taking that bishop off the board, even though our knight on e4 is a strong piece. But we're just going to get the other knight to the same square. So it's not like we're really giving away the knight. We're just replacing one knight with the other, unless he plays knight d2, which would be a pretty passive move, but it would take the sting out of knight e4. Okay, queen c2. I don't see a reason for us to refrain from shoving the other knight into the outpost. Knight d2. Okay, that was his idea. Now we need to use some tactics in order to preserve this knight on e4. Does anybody see a way that we could create a situation in which white cannot take on e4? Yeah, so we play queen g5. This is a, a classic move. And this this has a couple of ideas. For, we're threatening. Obviously, we're threatening knights. Okay, and white immediately blunders. Yeah, white, white makes it unfun. Ooh, but there is one thing. After king h1, I think I see a much sexier move than knight f2 check. So we're hoping... Damn, he resigned. Yeah, I was hoping he wouldn't resign. Let's see. Let's start with that, actually. Does anybody see... Does anybody see the most efficient way to checkmate after king h1? So queen takes e2 wins, obviously. Knight f2 check wins. But knight g3 check, I think, is the fastest mate. h takes g3 and rook f6 with rook h6 to follow. There is no smothered mate because white can give up an exchange on f2. But this is a pretty situation where, despite it being white to move, there's just nothing that he can do. Just remember this. This is a classic mechanism. Like, white can put a rook on f2. We'll just take it. Yeah. So this is mate. Pretty underwhelming game. We didn't really get a chance to do anything. Yeah, so... The Nimzo Indian is one of those openings that kind of flies under the radar. Like, I don't think there's a chessable course for the Nimzo Indian. Even though it's it's definitely top three in terms of like objectively best openings especially when it's paired with something good against knight f3 so against knight f3 you can play a bunch of different things you can play bogo indian you can still give this check the queen's indian is b6 and then you can play uh d5 and after knight c3 bishop b4 is the rogozin which has been 
extremely popular in in the last few years. Um, and of course, white can also play the Catalan, which is a big reason that a lot of people don't play the Nimzo Indian. They don't like facing the Catalan, but honestly, the Catalan at like a level below 2500 is not that scary. Like all you really need to do if you are black against the Catalan is choose a setup and learn it. There's like five or six different variations that all lead to uh, very, very decent positions for black. And the simplest is probably to play the main line, to play bishop e7, castles, and then d takes e4. And if you want to play like the pros, uh, recently, does anybody know, uh, let's see who has, who is in tune with top level chess, what move in this position is extremely popular nowadays, when, whereas it was never even a move before? Does anybody know? Yeah, b5. And the reason that this has never been a move is because of a4. And this was always considered very bad because it was considered forced that black had to play b4. You cannot afford your entire pawn structure to be destroyed like this. And you cannot play a6 because the rook hangs. And yet, these people did play bishop or a6 or bishop b7. And this line has become ridiculously popular recently. And it turns out that if white just grabs the pawns, first of all, white cannot take here because of a takes b5. The rook is exposed. And if white takes b a6, knight a6, queen c4, and after bishop d5, black gets a pretty big initiative in return for the pawn. And this line basically equalizes. So this is worth exploring if you need a line with black against the Catalan. There's a lot more to this, obviously. Like, white can avoid this by playing queen a4. But this allows black to enter the favorable main line, a6, queen takes c4, and b5. The reason people started playing queen c2 is that after a6, a4 became extremely popular. Like, this move became the way to fight for an advantage, whereas earlier, people had been taking automatically on c4 and getting into this variation, uh, which is now considered completely fine for black. But there's still a lot to, a lot to learn here. Um, so definitely you should learn the Catalan if you're a Nimzo player. And then you should learn the Nimzo proper because it's, it's pretty vast. Brandon played e3 against me in the tournament which is the Rubenstein variation, probably the most reputable line. Queen c2 is the kind of more ambitious variation. And, you know, there's a bunch of other moves. Bishop d2, what our opponent played. Bishop g5 is a Leningrad variation. g3 here is possible. Of course, white can play knight f3, and then black has the option of transposing into the Rogozin with d5. Uh, and there's the move f3, which I've played with white. There's the move a3, which is quite similar to f3. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton to learn if you're a Nimzo player. But the good thing about playing the Nimzo is that most of the time you can kind of improvise, and if you know the main setups, if you like understand where the pieces <clears throat> where the pieces usually go, then you can generally get a decent position against most lines. And one of those very typical setups is indeed to take the knight, and the idea of bishop d2, of course, is to take back with the bishop to keep the integrity of the queenside pawn structure. And then we play b6, and black is slightly worse in this setup. Like, I don't dispute that the engine usually gives like 0.4, 0.5 uh, in these types of positions, but it's really, really solid. Like, black has no weaknesses. Every piece is doing something, and it's very easy to play. <clears throat> but generally, the reason that white is considered to be better in these structures has to do with the move d5. So I actually think queen c2... Queen c2 is fine, but if I were white, I would actually keep the bishop with bishop e1. I would keep the bishop pair. And the reason I think a lot of people would hesitate to play a move like bishop e1 is that you'd think, well, the bishop is terrible on e1. But again, when you're discussing and you're thinking about piece placement, piece placement is often temporary. Whereas a bishop pair is a more long-lasting advantage. You're eventually going to improve the bishop. And on the next move you can potentially push the d-pawn up to d5. So for example, f5, white can already play d5, forcing black to play e5, and now white has a clamp on some of these squares. I would keep the bishop here. Queen c2 is fine, f5, rook a d1. So we take the bishop, we get the other knight around to e4. Notice that d5 here, sometimes this is a pawn sacrifice. 
that is used in order to open up the position and kind of introduce weaknesses into black's position. But specifically here, it might not work. So EDCD. Now, which way should black take? Who can tell me? Bishop or knight takes? What is better? Well, knight attacks the queen and is tempting for that reason. But again, do not be lulled into a move just because it creates a threat. And if you think tactically, you will, you will realize that knight d5 succumbs to bishop c4. Very, very nasty move. It does not win the knight because you have c6. But just look at this freaking position. I mean, just look at this. If if dictionary had a, like a, a definition for good knight against bad bishop, this would probably be the position. So for that reason, you should take with a bishop. And you might say, ah, but white can take and sack the exchange and do that again. But it's the same position except white is sacrificed in exchange. That's a little bit of a of a steep price to pay. Also, you've gotten rid of the bishop. And if queen c4, then you still play c6. Classic concept. You basically give away the pawn, but at least the knight is unpinned and you're still up in exchange. Um, anyway, so d5 was interesting, but I don't think it was all that effective. Queen c2 is... I mean, our opponent played totally fine up until the very end of the game. Maybe knight d2 is inaccurate on account of queen g5. And as you can tell, when you put a significant amount of pressure on even players in like the 2000 range, they tend to collapse really quickly. So what should white have done instead? That's actually a good question. First of all, knight takes e4 loses the game. Bishop takes e4. This is a classic fork. Attacking the queen, attacking checkmate. Now, bishop f3 is very tempting, putting the bishop directly opposite our bishop. So how does this line go? Let's calculate. So we play knight takes d2, right? If white takes back on d2, then we take the bishop and we win. So bishop takes bishop. Now we take the rook. So classic uh, line where I'm saying classic a lot, but basically both sides are taking each other's pieces. And in such scenarios, you have to look for desperados, right? You have to say, all right, well, I'm probably going to lose the knight anyway, so I might as well give it up for as much as I can take. And we have the incredibly strong move, knight takes e3. And if f takes e3, we don't rush to take the bishop. We actually can take on e3 again, check. And then we take the bishop on the next move. We're up two pawns. We're up two pawns. By the way, if you're playing white, interesting little side note. If you're playing white here and you're trying to salvage as much material as possible, what should you do in this position? Like if you're white, you shouldn't automatically take the knight. Yeah, queen d2 or queen c1. Queen d2 or queen c1 is actually the best move because the knight is pinned. So at this point, we have nothing better to do than to take the bishop, and white limits his material losses to one pawn. Still, obviously very bad for white, not what you would want. And that doesn't leave white with too many options. I mean, there is the move g3, but that's very, very weakening. And we can already start thinking about lifting the rook up to h6. You actually have a good amount of Nimzo Indian wins that happen precisely with this kind of attack. Like, exactly this kind of arrangement of pieces where you play queen g5 white falls asleep on the king side and before you know it, there's a rook on h6 you know there, there's sacrifices on h2 and you can actually win a pretty brilliant you know pretty brilliant attacking games with this configuration of pieces let me see what i can find here there's there's a cool game actually black beat a gm and you'll get to see that i'm not making making stuff up about you know, about the setup that I just showed you, that it's actually a thing that very strong players do. So Farintos was a grandmaster. Schneider, I guess, is an IM. Yeah, IM. He's still alive. So Nimzo Indian, queen c2 variation. But you can see a3, bishop c3, b6. So here's that setup, e3, d6, before knight bd7. So you can see that even strong players are fans of the setup. Okay, so here you can see that Ferintos has managed to keep his bishop pair. And the bishop is on b2 rather than d2. And here black plays another very typical move for these types of positions, which is c5. And you, you control part of the center. You create a good amount of central tension. dc, and now you, you take with the opposite pawn. Classic motif. bc, you have dc. If dc, you play bc. This is also a thing in the Sicilian, by the way, when you play f5. If white takes with the e pawn, you take with the g pawn. You, 
I think there's even a name for this where you take with the other pawn. Anyways, b5, f5, castles black plays e5. So this creates a backward pawn, but at least it shuts the bishop out. And after knight e1, there's that queen g5 move again. And white just kind of starts shuffling his pieces aimlessly, and boom, rook f6. And white thinks, oh, I got you, f3, trapping the knight. Trapping the knight. Does anybody, can anybody spot? And this is not an extraordinary move, but it's a, it's a strong attacking move. What do you do? How do you save the knight? Do you sacrifice it? If so, how? Yeah, you play rook g6 simply. Simple move. Fv, you have bishop takes e4, attacking the queen and creating bishop takes g2, which is a massive threat. So rook g6, rook d1. I like how black just chills on e4, no problem. But here, white plays queen b3, understandable move. And that's actually why white played rook d1, because now the knight can escape back to f6, but you're going to lose the d6 pawn. You're going to lose the backward pawn. But all of a sudden, notice how white's pieces have just sort of departed away from the king side. Bang, knight g3. Hg, queen takes g3. And it doesn't seem like black has any threats, but the problem is just that white cannot get black's pieces out of... You can't smoke the queen out of g3 easily, so black is not in much of a hurry. And black just goes rook h6, rook h2, and then e4, striking at the center. And in just overwhelming attack, queen h4, threatening checkmate on h1. Check, check. Take on e1. Oh, beautiful move. Sacking the queen. Oh, man. Bishop takes e4. Wow. And rook takes e3 with a mating attack. That's, that's actually pretty lovely. White has to go here, and then you basically just take everything. And at the end of the day, you're going to be up a piece. Great attack. I didn't even notice that black had sacked a queen at the end of this. Rook takes e1. Simple, but very, very pretty. Um, yeah, like four pawns. <clears throat> but anyways, you, you get the point. The Nimzo is not just a, a lame positional opening. It's, you know, it, it is a gateway to some pretty cool attacks, especially in this particular kind of structure. Thank you, Keza, for the tier one. Yeah, anyways, um, F3 was just a terrible blunder. And after queen takes e3 check. Oh, it had a very cool attack. It had a failed attack by the player playing white. White take with the other pawn. Oh. Yeah, to create an imbalance in the center and also to keep the d-file closed. Because white has easier access to the d-file than black does. Anyways, alright guys, I'm going to call it. It's, it's past four, so. Thank you everybody for the support. Pretty good blitz today. Definitely will stream tomorrow and... uh I'll see y'all later.